Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Michael Spath, and I'm the Executive Director of the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace, based in Fort Wayne, Indiana. We're the Indiana Voice for Peace, Justice, Human Rights, and Intercultural Encounter. I'm also a member of the Palestine-Israel Network of the United Church of Christ. Really delighted today uh, to speak with Dr. James Zogby, co-founder and director of the Arab American Institute. Dr. Zogby served two terms as President Obama's appointee to the United States Commission on International Religious Freedom, as well as in leadership roles in the Democratic National Committee, and has worked for decades to build Arab American political power in the United States. Dr. Zogby, uh, welcome. Thank you for hosting me. I want to get right into it, if you don't mind. Uh, just two days ago at a speech outside Pittsburgh, the president complained about both uh, representatives Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and uh, Ilhan Omar asking the latter rhetorically, how's your country doing? And accusing her of, quote, telling us how to run our country. You tweeted, I don't know whether to be, to be more pained by Trump's disregard for Ilhan Omar's amazing American story or frightened by his racist incitement. He's a dangerous, pathetic bully. He's our Mussolini who said it couldn't happen here. It did. You want to say more about that? I, I, I actually make a study of uh, my, hundred, my 280 characters and I kind of think I said it all right there. Uh, I think what's disturbing is that uh, in the New York neighborhood I grew up in, that's the kind of talk bullies used. Uh, on the street corner, uh, th that it is being done by the person who sits in the Oval Office is uh, profoundly disturbing to, uh, to who we are as a country. Uh, I mean, I, I, there's all kinds of reasons why I would be one who opposed Donald Trump and I'd list, you know, I could list like dozens of issues, but I think on the top of the list would be uh, the, the damage that he's done to our, our, our political culture um, and the incitement that he has uh, engaged in uh, against a, a range of uh, ethnic and religious communities. It's really disturbing. And uh, it's on full display during this campaign. And my, my concern is not so much even what he's doing now, but, um, but what impact it's going to have as we go forward. I, I think that once you poison the, the well, it's really difficult to, to detox uh, and to, uh, to change the political culture back to greater civility, greater respect, greater tolerance. Um, and we're seeing it play out. I mean, I, I say sometimes, I, I don't know whether I'm more worried about what happens before the election, the election itself, or what happens after. I think all three concern me. And, and certainly the, the after part uh, concerns me because I, I think that he's preparing the ground for declaring this a fraudulent election. I don't think he, he wants to leave peacefully. Um, and I think we've already seen him call his folks to use arms uh, as they did on state capitals over the issue of uh, uh, states doing lockdown measures to make us healthy, <laughs> to keep us safe and secure and free of disease. Um, and uh, we saw them at Black Lives Matter rallies. And I'm afraid what we'd see after an election, uh, I think it's very disturbing. It's difficult to, it's difficult to deal with someone who is shameless who can't be shamed, you know? And so, as you pointed out, the destruction of civic culture, of, of, of understood and practiced longstanding norms in our society, that's gonna have lasting damage. I'm, I'm afraid you're right. Uh, you, you've spoken rather openly about the discrimination you experienced when you were in graduate school, mm -hmm. uh, the threats you experienced. As part of your dissertation research, you received a grant to travel to Lebanon. And here's how you put it. We went to the camps, heard their stories, and it was transformative. I remember on the way back saying to my wife, we're never going to be the same again. And we weren't. 
Well, I learned a lesson that if you truly listen to people, you then have a responsibility to act on what you've heard. And this old, old woman in the camp the day I left looked at me in, in the eye and said, we told you everything. What are you going to do about it now? And it haunted me. Mm. That uh, set you on uh, uh, your activist path? She haunted me. She did. Uh, the time in the camps haunted me. Uh, I met people. I met families. Um, I, she showed me the key to her house. She showed me a photo album of the house. I, I was collecting stories of 1948. This was 1970. It was just uh, 20, 22 years after, 71 rather, 23 years after the, the Nakba. And uh, everyone had a story and everyone had photographs and everyone uh, showed me uh, you know, what, what their life had been like in Palestine. And what struck me too was going into the camps um, was the extent to which in incredible poverty, uh, they had recreated village life in the camps. Uh, if, you, right. if you got to the camp and you said, I'm looking for such and such, um, they would say, oh, he's from, and they'd name the village, and they say that the, the way you get there is you walk down this path. And when you get to Saf Saf, uh, you turn left and then you go down to, you know, and then the, each village and then you'd find the, the, the village compound. And then, you know, you, if you've been to a Palestinian village and you know, like sitting outdoors under a, a grape arbor, well, there I was in Ayn al-Hedwi sitting under a grape arbor but then when you looked, you saw that the grapes were growing out of, the, the vines were growing out of oil cans uh, that were filled with soil. And if you sat in the kitchen and you looked out, you saw plants that were growing in coffee cans on a little ledge outside the window of the, of the place. They had, they had attempted to recreate the, the village environment and they'd lived in the, the same compounds that they had lived in in the village with families next to each other and they elected a, a Mukhtar, the, the who was the, to be the leader of the village. And they, they, they were protecting um, who they were and still hoping to, to return. Now, um, I, having had that experience and the rest of the story is on the plane, uh, my, my wife and I flew back from Amman because we'd spent time in the camps in Lebanon and then in Jordan. And then on the way back, uh, we flew to London and then got a flight from London back to, D to DC. Or, uh, and <laughs> the, there was a young woman who I had taught the, the, the semester before that at Temple University. Um, and she said, oh, Mr. Zogby, I just went home this summer. I said, oh, really? You're from Philly, right? And she said, no, I went to my real home, Israel. And I mean, there's a kid, uh, you know, I'd gotten to know kids in the class and she was born in Philly or families from Philadelphia, generations in Philly. And she was talking about her experience um, in, um, you know, in, in having been on a kibbutz in Israel. And I, I was struck by that and couldn't, uh, figure out how to compute, you know, the having been in the camp with people who <laughs> had come from Palestine, who had the keys to their homes, who told me the stories that they had, uh, that they had, uh, in, what they had endured in 48. And here's this girl telling me she went, she went home. Um, and so it was now her home and no longer their home. And that really set me off in, 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 in terms of not just my thinking, but my mission. It was how to write that wrong, how to, how to create that picture. I remember I came back and I wrote uh, from the, the, the journal I'd kept, I wrote a, a piece, I extracted three parts, I called it Three Days in Palestine, and I had three vignettes. And I, I went and spoke at the Ethical Society in Philadelphia based on the articles, which had appeared in a, a newspaper in Philly. And people were going crazy. I mean, they were like, I mean, it was like talking about the lives of these people and, and people were getting so hostile. And, uh, and so as I left, a friend of mine, um, uh, Ed Marshall was his name. Uh, I taught him as well uh, in, in, you know, a year earlier. I said, Ed, what happened? He said, 
you just denied for them everything that they have been taught to believe. And that is that this is not, these are not human beings. And I said, I didn't say anything radical. He said, you did. You said the most radical thing of all. You made them see Palestinians as real people and they aren't ready to accept it. Wow. And so, um, you know, when I started the Palestine Human Rights Campaign, that was the mission. It was to, to, to round out this picture, to tell the story of real people uh, we didn't get involved in the politics uh, in the, the early years. I mean, we were, we were saying, this is a real person whose home has just been demolished. This is a real person who's sitting under administrative detention for three years without trial. This is a real young person who was tortured into giving a confession. We wanted people to see the, the humanity of, of, of these folks. And that all started with, uh, with uh, you know, this woman, Om Abed, who I, I met uh, uh, in the camps and who, grabbed my arm and stared me in the eye and said, what are you going to do with us? And I, um, I'm my, my, in many ways, my work is still an answer to her. This is what I'm doing. This is what I'm doing with you. Uh, she meant a lot to me. I never saw her again. Um, don't know what happened to her during all the wars that Lebanon has had to endure and the suffering in the camps. I'm sure she's passed away, but, uh, but she, she took a toll in it. That, excerpt, if you don't mind me continuing for a moment, uh, what was in that article came from a, a book, a larger book I wrote called Arab Voices, what they're saying to us. I, I wrote that story in there. Um, and in Arab Voices, the, the book is about listening. It's about the importance of listening, because if you listen, um, you learn. Uh, and all too often, we talk at people, uh, we operate with myths and, and, and act as if they're, the myths are, uh, are real. Um, ignorance uh, that is uh, compounded by certainty is really dangerous. And, and so I, I argue at the end of the, the, the story about this woman, I say, if you listen, you have a responsibility. And uh, um, it, it opens you up, not just to what is, what is real, but it opens you up to challenges that you have to face as a human being. I could tell from uh, the story that this woman um, really touched you in a way that would uh, change the direction of your life. And uh, I appreciate you expanding on the story very much. I wanna talk about your analysis of US interventionism in the Middle East in your recent book, The Tumultuous Decade. You identify two events, Israel, Israeli Prime Minister Sharon's foray into the Haram al-Sharif that led to the Second Intifada, and the Al-Qaeda terrorist attacks on 9-11, which led George W. Bush into a, quote, path of war and occupation in Afghanistan and Iraq that resulted in Middle East instability of the previous decade and emboldened Iran and the loss of respect for the U.S. This, this led then to the tumultuous decade, the last 10 years, which began with two more traumatic events in 2011. The first one, as you identified, it was the U.S. Uh, hastening its withdrawal from Iraq. And the second one, the beginning of what came to be known as the Arab Spring. Talk to us about why the tumultuous decade is such an appropriate title for your book. And what, what did you learn from your interviews with the people in the region? I mean, I know you want us to buy your book, but give us, give, give us a preview. I, I do want you to buy my book. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna lie. Um, let, me, let, me, uh, uh, let me say the following. Uh, it, in, the, in the early part of the book, I, um, I talk about what proceeded. And if you think back to uh, the end of the Cold War, uh, America emerged in, in a position of having been the sole victor of the Cold War. We were the preeminent power. Whether one agrees or not with the invasion of Kuwait, um, the reality was that uh, Saddam Hussein illegally occupied another country. I used to argue with my Palestinian friends back then who'd say, that America has a double standard. And I say, yeah, but we shouldn't have a double standard. I mean, if, if, if Palestine, uh, Palestinians deserve self-determination, the Kuwaitis do too. And uh, Saddam was uh, by any measure uh, a ruthless um, uh, dictator who, uh, who made 
uh, Iraqi people and in the Iraq-Iran war, uh, the Iranian people and his own people suffer immensely uh, from his, his adventurism and miscalculations. And so there he is in Kuwait and I had lots of friends in Kuwait and lots of friends in many countries of the Arab world. And, and I, I was reeling from the pain of that. And, and then I saw the day after he went in, uh, if you recall, Jim Baker and Edward Shevardnadze, uh, the then Russian or foreign minister, um, together in, uh, in a press conference saying, this will not stand. Uh, we will act to un unroll, unravel this and, and, and change this. And I thought that that was America at the end of the Cold War, right? And we built a coalition. Like I said, whether you agree with it or not, we, we took months to build a coalition. Um, we liberated the country. I have disagreements with what we did after liberating Kuwait. The, uh, the way we behaved was, was, was deplorable. Um, but the bombing of the withdrawing Iraqi troops, et cetera. But we had that role. And then even if the Clinton administration, while it acted on issues that Baker and Bush did not act on, for example, we, we intervened in Haiti, we uh, intervened in, uh, uh, in, in Bosnia. Uh, we tried to intervene in Somalia badly. Um, nevertheless, uh, they maintained a kind of a continuation of the Bush policy. Um, and then 9-11 happened. Um, after 9-11, we literally had the world in our hands, um, in the palm of our hand. I mean, James Fallows did a remarkable, uh, yeah, uh, everything Jim Fallows does is just brilliant, but there was a piece called Bush's Lost Year. It's what, well, the, what the situation in the world was after 9-11 and how virtually every country was at our beck and call. Um, we chose, instead of building international institutions, instead of building on that support to create a more stable world order, we undertook uh, a unilateral invasion of Iraq. And, and uh, that probably was the most destabilizing event um, in, in not just this century, but in the, in the last 50, 60 years, uh, even more destabilizing than Vietnam in the sense that uh, what, what we did was not only embroil ourselves in a long war that's still not over, um, but we also so diminished American leadership and its capacity to lead and the respect that it had around the world uh, that we've not recovered. And while the project for a new American century that, um, that promoted the war and one of the arguments they made promoting the war was uh, that they would, I, I, I remember them, them saying this, that they would, they, as per the name, the New American Century, New sure. Project for New American Century, they said um, that if we decisively used force um, and, and displayed our power, we would defeat an enemy and usher in a century where no one would challenge America's leadership again. Um, and so it was to create this, this unilateral world, this uh, unipolar world and preserve it uh, so that we would be the hegemonic power. What happened? Not only did we get uh, ground down in a, in a war that we couldn't win, um, but the diminishing of American power and respect uh, and the unleashing of other forces in the region uh, created a situation that uh, we're living with today. Um, one of the byproducts of the Iraq war was the, the unleashing of Iran. Uh, Iran had always had uh, a kind of a, 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 a desire to export its revolution. Uh, and now it was free to do so. Uh, the, their, their arch enemy, uh, Iraq, that they had fought a, a brutal war uh, against, uh, a brutal war mostly experienced on their side, but also on the Iraqi side. I mean, maybe a million people died in that, in that war. And we fed both sides, actually. Uh, Iraq uh, overtly and Iran surreptitiously. Um, we wanted to see them go at each other, and, but they were now free. Uh, they got a foothold in Iraq. Uh, they felt emboldened to um, export their, uh, their power elsewhere. Uh, at the same time, uh, other regional powers in reaction to the, both the, the decline of American influence and the, the unleashing of Iran 
uh, they came to the fore as well. Uh, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, uh, Russia, China are all playing roles today um, in, a, in a Middle East that is so difficult now to unravel. I mean, we talk about sometimes about, you know, conflicts being like an onion, you peel one layer and you keep going down. Um, and about the only thing that you get is you just end up crying, right? But, and that's kind of where we are. I mean, how do you unravel Syria? How do you unravel Libya? How do you unravel Yemen? Um, and the challenge is enormous, but it's all the result of Bush's uh, horrific war in, in Iraq that reduced American influence, reduced respect around the world, reduced American capacity to lead. Uh, the military uh, was straining from the fact that in an all-volunteer army, they simply didn't have people to go around anymore. And the, the amount of not just injury, but, but per permanent scarring of hundreds of thousands of young men and women from this war um, is, is still a toll that we're, we're paying for. Um, and that's what's led to the tumultuous decade. If anything, it was the Iraq War coupled with the fact that we went in stupidly and we left stupidly. Um, I blame Bush for going in. And as much as I hated going in, I, I remember when the Obama administration decided they, they had to honor the, the, the status of forces agreement that was up. Uh, Bush had negotiated that and Obama was uh, obliged to leave because American forces would have been left without protection. But the issue as I told uh, the Obama administration back then was it's not the date you set to leave. It's what you do between now and the date you leave. And what did he do? Um, Ayad Alawi, who was a moderate uh, Shia leader who understood the need for a unified Iraq, won the election. But Iran didn't support him and many of the pro-Iranian parties didn't support him. We abandoned him and we put in office instead with Iran's agreement um, a, a guy who, when America left, pursued, as we should have known he would pursue, a strictly sectarian agenda. He fired his two uh, Sunni vice presidents, um, both of whom were charged with crimes that they didn't commit, both forced into exile. The agreement that we had made that at the end of uh, the, the, the Iraqi civil war, the 100,000 person uh, Sunni uh, militia that had been formed to help us defeat Al-Qaeda uh, in Anbar province. The agreement was that they would be merged into the Iraqi military. Um, and we abandoned that, or Maliki abandoned that and left them out there. Hang Literally created the conditions for ISIS to come into being. Um, ISIS picked up on Sunni resentment uh, and on the, the continued anger at, at Iran and Iran's role in the country. And that's kind of where we, where we are. Arab Spring is something quite different. It was an internal uh, problem in several Arab countries. Um, not, we use the term Arab Spring. It's I always, I always yeah. find it interesting in history that um, <laughs> we, w when you don't know something, you see it through the prism of what you do know. So um, when we went into Iraq, there were writers who were saying, it's like America, you know, like the, Navy, the forces going into Paris to liberate Paris. No, it wasn't. We weren't liberating anything, right? Um, uh, when we got ground down in Iraq, all of a sudden it became Vietnam. Um, it, it, we had to see it through something. Well, when the, the, the first demonstrations occurred in Tunisia and then in Egypt, we saw it like the, Arab, like the, 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 the spring, the Prague Spring, or what happened after the fall of the Soviet Union. No such thing. This was not a unified order. Each right. country was unique in and of itself and, and rebelled for its own, its own reasons. Um, and I, I think that while Obama gets blamed in the, in, among Arab leaders for not protecting the existing order, um, and keeping Mubarak in office and Ben Ali in office, et cetera. I actually think that's the one place where he gets uh, uh, blamed uh, wrongly. He actually, uh, I think, understood what was at stake, uh, knew that the voices of democracy needed to be heard, um, unfortunately wasn't listened to, uh, either in the Arab world, <coughs> where I remember his ambassador lectured the young people saying, I, I get what you're doing, but form political parties and win an election. 
uh, do this peacefully. It's not going to work any other way. Well, they didn't. Um, and the result is the military came back. Um, uh, there was also this concern about Muslim Brotherhood playing a role, and it, it, it's a real problem, to be sure. Uh, Morsi was not going to allow Egypt uh, a normal uh, democratic development, and people were afraid of that. The military took advantage of that fear, and when they did their coup, that's what, they, that's what was at stake there. But those two events, the, the unraveling of the old order and the, the, the U.S. withdrawal from Iraq and what it wrought in the region, the decline of American leadership and the emergence of, of a multipolar <laughs> Middle East, those two things combined created what I call the tumultuous decade, where, where basically, if you look at the Middle East today, it is unrecognizable from what it was uh, uh, a decade ago. And, uh, and I still don't know where it comes out. I don't think anyone does know where it comes out, but it certainly isn't gonna be in the same place that it was. I have a number of questions here uh, in the chat room, so I'm going to try to get to them, uh, uh, as well as some of the questions I have here for you. Um, you recently wrote uh, in Mondo Weiss, what has troubled me are critics who say that the UAE uh, normalization, now Bahrain too, uh, is out of sync with the overwhelming majority of Arab public opinion on how to achieve Palestinians' rights. This is not true. Attitudes across the Arab world have undergone a dramatic change in the past few years, and this new political rally, reality must be understood. Yeah. Tell us about the, this dramatic change uh, and what's the new reality? Well, what hasn't changed is, is support for Palestinians as people uh, and the issue of Palestinian rights. What has changed is whether resolving the Arab-Israeli conflict remains the priority in a region where you have Syria, um, Al-Qaeda and ISIS, uh, Iraq, uh, Iran, uh, repressive regimes uh, in, in places like President Sisi is worse than President Mubarak was on a good day. Um, Lebanon is in state of collapse. Um, in the midst of all of this, uh, ask Arabs what their political priorities are. They used to say Palestine. They don't anymore. They talk about uh, economic well-being. They talk about um, building a more stable region where countries can invest in each other. They want a future for their families and for their lives. And so they just don't see resolving the conflict or the expenditure of resources resolving that conflict as, uh, as the priority. And that's sad. It's, look, this is a cause I've given most of my life to, to working on, and here we are in a very different reality. Um, at the same time, um, uh, when we ask questions about the Arab Peace Initiative, they say, yeah, we still support it. But then they say, and this was in the most, more, most recent polls I've done, they say, but something more has to be done to convince Israel to, to change direction. And when we ask them about whether normalization might be desirable, a, a surprising number of people say, yeah. When we ask them why it might be desirable, they say, because maybe it'll give us leverage uh, to change Israel's attitudes. Maybe it'll stop the killing. Maybe it'll stop these policies that are hurting people. Maybe it'll be an economic benefit for everybody in the region. Uh, and they, they have all these different reasons. So that I think that the, the, the sort of the, it's the end of the world, folks, uh, or it's the beginning of the whole new world order of peace in the Middle East. I mean, both those views are wrong, um, as well as the view that the overwhelming majority of all Arabs are opposed to this is wrong. It's a much more nuanced region right now that is dealing with many, many issues, and they're kind of looking for a way out. And they're looking for leadership. They're looking for vision. They're looking for a strategy to go forward, and they're not finding it. Uh, they're certainly not finding it from the, the ossified Palestinian leadership, which troubles me. I mean, I, I would like to see the Palestinian leadership provide vision and strategy. They don't. They don't. And people have, have given up, uh, not only in the Arab world, but in the Palestinian community itself, they've given up on, on whether or not the PA and, and or Hamas uh, alone or combined um, can, can provide anything that makes a, a, a significant difference. People want to be inspired and they're not feeling it right now. 
And, and so, yeah, let's give this a chance to see if it works. Now, I'll tell you something. One of the other questions we said is if Israel continues to do what they're doing, should normalization continue? About 75% across the region say, no, stop. So that if the Palestinians were to do something that awakens the conscience of the region again and says, this is something we have to focus on, I'd say we're in a different we're in a different ball game, but we're not there right now, and uh, and that's that's I think you know. And the other one other point is that for those Israelis who say okay this is over, and for the Palestinians who say oh my God it's over, both are wrong. Uh, as long as the majority of the people between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea are Arabs, uh, and as long as the majority of them have absolutely no rights, and some of them those who are citizens of Israel are second class citizens of Israel. This issue is not going away anytime soon. And as long as you have millions of people, refugees wanting to return to their homes or properties uh, or be recognized for the injustice that, 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 that was imposed upon them, uh, Israel's not gonna have peace. And, and that's bottom line. They can make peace with 180 countries. It's not gonna solve the problem. They've got to deal with history and justice. Let me ask you, um, to, to pursue this a little bit further, uh, there's a number of questions that we have here asking about the one democratic state. Whatever, whatever one of the configurations that are out there that it looks like, are you seeing a, a demographic shift uh, with uh, young Palestinians and young Arabs in support of one democratic state? And do you have a kind of a you have kind of an idea what that might look like, uh, uh, right of return, reparations. You know, I, what, what, what are you finding in your research? Well, in the research I'm finding, the Palestinians themselves um, uh, don't see a way forward right now. Uh, many of them say two states. Many of them say one state. Uh, many of them say they don't know what the future holds at all. And, and actually, that's a plurality. Uh, just don't know. Um, it, it, it's sad, but it's true that in the West Bank, primarily in the West Bank, but also in Gaza, East Jerusalem is different. It's a more, more radicalized population there. Um, there's a sense that what matters most is, I got to get food on the table to feed my kids. I got I to gotta find a job to be able to survive. I've got to find a way to get this um, you know, the, these restrictions off my back so that I can, I can function, farm my land and, and, and build, a, build a new house. I mean, those are the, the, the pressing concerns. So it's almost indecent um, in the face of this situation to say, uh, do you want one state or two states and where should the border be? And what, you know, th th that's not where that their heads are at. Um, what I do think though, is that we've clearly turned a corner. Um, uh, I remember ever since I got into this game, uh, they were telling me it was five minutes to midnight. Um, and, well, we're like at two o'clock in the morning now, it's, it's over. Um, it would be nice. I always thought that the cleanest uh, approach would be two states. Um, cleanest in the sense that um, it would, not for the, the demographic slash racist reasons that Israelis wanted two states so that they could get rid of their, their Arab demographic um, problem. Um, but, but because it was the shortest distance to how you solve a problem and create some stable order so that Palestinians survive, Israelis survive, and then we can work out a different future. But with 650,000 settlers in the West Bank, and not just in the West Bank, but in strategic positions in the West Bank, um, so that it almost makes the possibility of two state, not almost, it makes the possibility of separating people, and just, you, you can't even, there's no way to draw the map. Uh, they, they built, and this was a plan going back to the 70s. It was, right. we put them in places and then connect them with roads and infrastructure, uh, and with security zones, so that contiguity was 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 impossible, and that's where we are now. Is is Israel going to uproot people? No. We saw the the the, the demonstration, the play uh, uh, playing on the hearts of people with five thousand, seven thousand people evicted from Gaza. Imagine 
given the composition of the settler community in the West Bank, if you took them out of Hebron, if you took them out of um, Ariel uh, in, the, in the heart of the West Bank, if you took them out of uh, the areas around Bethlehem that are strangling that little town, um, you, you'd, there'd be literally, literally a holy war. That being the case, um, I, instead of focusing on that political solution, I look at the issues of human rights and justice. Uh, how do we protect human rights? How do we promote justice? And how do we promote equality? Um, how do we guarantee equal rights, equal right, economic rights, political rights, social rights for people in the West Bank, Gaza, East Jerusalem, those living under occupation? Um, and how do we promote equal justice and rights for, for the Palestinian Arab citizens of Israel? It's the same thing. And that's a longer haul. It's not as clean and, and you draw a line and we're, you know, whatever. But it's kind of where we are right now. And I think that those who are still, I, I say that in American politics, um, the two-state solution has become the two-state absolution. It's, um, I remember I, I first came up with that when the New York Times in the beginning of this presidential cycle interviewed all the candidates. And one of the questions they asked them was, um, would you apply human rights standards to Israel um, in the treatment of Palestinians? And Bernie answered well, Buttigieg answered well. Um, but then I remember Amy Klobuchar, I watched her because they had the videos as well as the transcripts. And I watched her give the answer. And it reminded me of, a, I read the cartoons all the time, uh, comic strips in the paper, Big Nate on the day of a pop quiz. When you get the question, his eyes bug out of his head. You know, it's like, oh my God, what am I gonna say? And, uh, and then all of a sudden it popped into her head. I, I support a two-state solution. <laughs> Did I get it right? Can I go now? Um, and that, that's kind of the way they look at it is that I don't wanna talk about it, but I support a two-state solution. It's safe, it's never gonna happen. I'm never gonna be called on to do anything, but it gets me off the hook. I don't have to talk about anything else. That to me is unacceptable. Um, you are not absolved from addressing human rights and the accountability that Israel should be held to for its behaviors. Um, and, uh, and so I'm not, I'm not absolving anybody for uh, supporting something that isn't gonna happen and that they're never gonna do anything to help make it happen. If they truly wanted two states, they would have 20 years ago or even today, they would have put economic sanctions on Israel. They would have put political conditions on Israel for its behavior. They don't. And so they basically have joined Israel. They, while Israel was busy digging a hole for itself in the West Bank, um, they were holding, holding their coat uh, for them and acting as cheerleaders for them. And that's kind of where we are today. Israel made this mess and there's no way out of it because number one, they don't want to get out of it. And number two, there's the, it's just not going to happen. Therefore, they own one state and they own an apartheid state. It's not going to be an apartheid state. It is an apartheid state and it has to be dealt with as such. I wanna to move to domestic politics. Um, um, as you know, yesterday, um, no murder or manslaughter charges were handed down to any of the three officers in the Breonna Taylor uh, shooting in Louisville. There are uh, uh, protests in cities big and small uh, uh, around the country protesting uh, the murder of black and brown people, uh, uh, often at the hands of uh, uh, police. Local and state police, the National Guard, even private mercenary groups have been deployed. Systemic racism, the Black Lives Movement, the militarization, militarization of police, the Israelification of the training of police and domestic security. This is a, 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 a brew, right? It's, it's, a, it's a dangerous mix and brew that's occurring. Can you say a word about uh, uh, that? Uh, I mean, it's a complicated question, I know, but say a word about that mix as well as the mix of the Black Lives uh, Movement and the Palestine Solidarity Groups in addressing in addressing these issues. Um, well, that's not, as you say, not an easy question because it's multiple questions. But let me try to pull it apart. Uh, number one, um, the official violence in the Black community is not new. Um, when I was living in Philadelphia in the nineteen sixties. 
Um, I remember I was working at a boys club um, and um, the, the bro boys club had a program run by the police athletic league and uh, it was an all black boys club and the police brought over coloring books um, and the coloring book was uh, officer friendly, right? And the cover of it had officer friendly, no head just from the waist down because it was a big, big guy holding the hand of a little girl walking her across the street and the kids were to color it in. And when I passed it out, little girl who was about eight years old. She said, "Uh Oh, she's in trouble. And I said, what? She said, he's taking her in. And I said, no, no, he's walking her across the street. And she said, no, he's taking her in. And I mean, that, that sense almost ingrained into the black urban experience was that the police are not officer friendly. Uh, there were shootings back then uh, of, of unarmed uh, black men and of, of, of uh, unnecessary violence. Uh, that was the time, if you recall, of the Black Panthers and uh, the Black Panthers rose up in reaction to uh, this kind of, of endemic uh, police violence. It's not new, it's gotten worse. And as you say, it's gotten militarized. I mean, when I, I will never forget sitting in my living room, watching the Ferguson, uh, the, the invasion of Ferguson. Um, it was like watching the invasion of Beirut by the Israelis. I mean, they went in, there was tear gas everywhere. There were tanks. Uh, it looked like a military takeover, which is what it was. The military in this case though, were the police. <coughs> Um, we have lots to un un unpack here in, in this country. It's, it's not training of police. Um, it's dismantling of practices that have created out of our police force, literally an occupation army in, in, in poor black neighborhoods. It's changing a political culture um, and a police culture um, that requires more than training, but requires, as I said, literally dismantling. And that's not an easy job to do because there are real problems in, in our cities. Um, and it's not just problems in black neighborhoods, it's problems across the board. We've, we've long had a problem um, that has in, in, you know, affected every immigrant community, whether uh, Arab or Italian or Greek or Polish or Albanian or whatever, you know, um, when you are locked out, you find alternative means uh, that are usually criminal <laughs> or, or not accepted. I mean, it used to be that the, um, the way they talk in New York was that the, 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 the Irish police were the, the, they were the gangsters in uniform and the, the Italian mafia were, they were the gangsters out of uniform I and mean, they kind of went at each other. Um, we have a problem. Um, we're not addressing it. Um, but what we're seeing today is for the first time, uh, a popular mobilization calling us to account for it, uh, which I think is uh, eminently supportable. Uh, <clears throat> I, uh, I think that it's critical that it be nonviolent. Um, I think that the degree to which it becomes violent, it plays into the hands of those who only want to see it perpetuated. Um, certainly Donald Trump is making you know, a, a field day off of, uh, out of it. Um, a heyday, rather, I think that's the expression. It's the day you mow the hay down and bring it into the barn. Um, he's, he's using it for his own purposes. Um, and of course, there is an Israel connection. I mean, we, and I think, I, I think that the Jewish Voice for Peace uh, group has been marvelous in uh, educating and challenging police departments to break off their ties with, um, uh, with Israel. Um, the training that Israel provides, not just the police, but also the, the precedents that they set in airport security and in uh, econ electronic surveillance, which is now being used throughout the Arab countries in the Gulf, for example, um, and is being used here as well, um, is not, these are not the exports that uh, you actually want to be known for <laughs> in the long term, but they certainly are what they're known for today. I, I'd also, um, I'd also add that uh, that on the Black Lives Matter issue, we've seen in polling, and this is again, not new. Uh, it goes back to the period when the civil rights movement began to evolve towards cultural nationalism. Um, this identity of uh, identification of, um, 
of uh, the nationalist wing in the black community seeing itself part of a global, uh, a global movement. That's become even more so today, um, where there's a, a kind of a, a people of color identity with, uh, there, it was with Arafat and the PLO at one point, uh, certainly the Black Panthers uh, and the, the African nationalist movement here in America. But, uh, but clearly uh, today among Black Lives Matter, there's a sense they see Palestine as their cause. And, uh, and I'm delighted that they do. Uh, and certainly I think in the Palestinian community, you have a support back uh, to Black Lives Matter because they see an identity in the struggle here as well. Um, and that's important. Um, we, I, there are plenty of reasons to account for this. But certainly one of them is this growing sense of a global consciousness among young people. Um, and certainly there's a bonding over being people of color and, and those issues I think are real um, and are to be, uh, to be recognized. One of the one of the reasons we wanted to have this conversation with you is because oh the, now you're going to get to it yeah because of the many advances that uh, Arab Americans and particularly Muslims uh, have been uh, making uh, in U.S. politics in recent years Jamal Bowman uh, ousted Elliot Engel Rashid Tlaib Ilhan Omar uh, Alexandria Cort uh, uh, Ocasio Cortez you know their support for Palestine and Palestine and uh, uh, Rashida Tlaib, Palestine herself. Um, uh, Corey Bush uh, in Missouri beat longtime Israel supporter William Lacey Clay. Betty McCollum and her initiatives. Uh, we have Muslims uh, in, in uh, office, Keith Ellison in Minnesota and Andre Carson here in Indianapolis, prominent Muslim uh, American uh, political uh, folks. Are you optimistic? Uh, I, I mean, is this, are these just anecdotal kind of instances or, or do you find that there's really a, a shift that's taking place with Arab Americans and Muslim Americans and support for Palestine, et cetera, in the American political system? Well, here's a, here's a, a rule of thumb. When you're talking about anecdotes and the number of them you have to rattle off, take you as long as it just took you, <laughs> it's not an anecdote anymore. Then something's happening. Right, and uh, and it clearly is. Uh, it's trans I always say this. I say that if you want to know where you are, think of where you were. Look at where you are, and that trajectory is kind of where you're going, right? And and so I see real change. I mean, look, I got into this work back in the in the '70s here in Washington, where uh, I couldn't get. I used to tease John Conyers because he'd come to our events in Michigan. His district was in the, in the Arab, Arab part of Michigan. And he'd say, I support you people and your cause. Your cause is a good cause and you have every reason to support your cause. And I think it's great that you're working for your cause. He wouldn't say, I used to say the P word. He wouldn't say the P word. <laughs> uh, and, uh, uh, and that's changed. Um, it's changed, I think, because, and it's not the Muslim community. The Muslim community is, the Arab community is diverse, the Muslim community is more diverse. Um, yeah. And there's a whole lot of American Muslims who don't give a damn about any of these issues because they're either converts here or they're from South Asia and they got their own issues. They got Kashmir, for example, which is bigger for them than, than Palestine. But with the Arab community, you see a real transformation taking place. Um, I remember, I, I tell the story all the time in Dearborn, Michigan, first time, we started the Institute in 1985. It grew out of the Jesse Jackson 84 presidential campaign when we saw Arab Americans empowered. And we said, we're gonna nationalize this process. We're gonna make voter registration a priority, get people running for office, get them into the political parties. We don't want any more exclusion because we used to get our money given back. We'd have candidates reject our endorsements, et cetera. Uh, and so we did, we, we started, founded it in early 85 and getting ready for 88. And um, two weeks later, I got a call from Dearborn saying, you gotta come here, we're having a real problem. The guy running for mayor was running on the platform, what to do about the Arab problem. He had just sent a tabloid newspaper with New York Daily News size headlines across the top saying what to do about the Arab problem on the front page. And people were traumatized. There were about like 18,000 uh, Arab, uh, Arab, Arab Americans in Dearborn at the time. 
and um, um, and they were uh, they were pretty shocked. Uh, I went up there and I said, you know, we're going to deal with this. And we're, we went over to city hall. We got the county, the city clerk. We got the voter rolls. We found 700 Arab, Arab American registered voters out of like 18 something thousand people in a city of 93,000. And I thought to myself, holy God, you know, no wonder they're being picked on because they can't hurt them and they can't help them, right? I mean, he was saying that they're, they're dirty, they, have, they don't speak our language, they're uh, you know, gonna ruin our culture, uh, all the things that Trump is saying today. Um, we did, we founded the voter registration project and we did our work. And in 1996, we had a candidate's night and I went up there, we were hosting it. And that same guy was still mayor. He run the first time in 85, he was still mayor in 96. He gave me the maspaha, the, the worry beads of the city. Uh, instead of, he didn't give the keys to the city anymore. He gave that instead. Spoke a little Arabic, quoted from the Quran, my dear brothers and sisters, he said. And the guy sitting next to me, I told him the story, the guy from the White, a guy from the White House um, uh, who'd come to represent Bill Clinton at this candidate's night. <laughs> he leaned over and he said to me, he said, son of a bitch knows how to, knows how to count. Because um, at that point, there were 7,000 registered voters in Dearborn. Uh, and today there's about 14,000 registered voters in Dearborn and Arab American and the president of the city council is Arab American. The majority of the city council is Arab American. The state representative from Dearborn is an Arab American. And there are three judges uh, who are Arab American from Dearborn and, um, and the chief of police. Uh, and so the issue is that they got power now. And we've done the same thing in Patterson, New Jersey. And we've done the same thing in other cities as well. And so people don't give us money back anymore. And people pay attention now. And when, when Jamal Bowman's running for office, he says, can you guys help me? Corey Bush is running, can you guys help me? Um, in, in the Lipinski race, they'd supported Lipinski for years because that's an area where there's a lot, of Arab, a lot of Arabs. They didn't support him this time. They supported uh, his opponent and, uh, and, and Marie won. And so the issue is that we are today, I, people say to, say to me, they'll say, well, they're just, they're just pandering to us. And I say, oh, pardon me again, I'm gonna get a little crude here. I say, yeah, I've been pissed on and I've been pandered to. Guess what, pandering feels a lot better. Um, and that's kind of where we are. Um, we've made some progress, but it's not just that we've made progress, it's that there's change in the country as a whole. Um, the, 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 the development of J Street, open space for debate in Congress that didn't exist before. The, 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 the persistence uh, and the, the development of groups like Jewish Voice for Peace, like um, uh, If Not Now, like uh, Bend the Ark, like groups of that sort that have actually changed the political dynamic within the Jewish community and given members of Congress an alternative Jewish voice to go to, that's huge. Um, as well as, look at the polls, um, African-American, Latino, uh, Asian, young people, generally young people, have much more progressive views on Middle East issues, are much more tolerant. My brother calls them the first global generation. They have, they're, they're the ones who are teaching their parents. I mean, why did, why did gay marriage change uh, attitudes in America? It was kids. Kids challenged their parents and their parents came on board because their kids, it was the children led them. And uh, that's where Obama, came from, was a, it was a children's movement. Every time I'd go, I did 11 state surrogate speaking for Obama in 2008. Every event I'd go to, didn't matter where it was, guy would come up to me and say, I'm here because my kids wanted me to come. Um, and that was the case as well with Bernie. I was just uh, gonna ask you if Bernie's, if Bernie's movement has legs post Bernie. Oh, it's, because it, look, it was Bernie, but it also wasn't Bernie. Bernie was the coalition of these various elements and he provided leadership to it. And certainly he did play a significant role. He was courageous, but I remember Bernie before he was Bernie. I remember on, on the Middle East, for example, and Bernie's always been a trans transformational figure in terms of his politics um, and his economic view of what is needed in America. But Bernie wasn't always good on the Middle East. And I remember talking to him about it and he was taking notes and he was thinking about it, getting familiar with the issue. But what really transformed him was a debate during 2015. He was in New York with Hillary Clinton 
and he got asked a question and he answered it about Palestine and the audience roared. And I could see the look on his face. It's like, oh, wait, this is a good one, right? And so he doubled down on it. Um, and other politicians have learned as well. This is something that'll work for you, not against you. And, uh, and we're just, you know, we're, we're, we're still seeing cowardice. We're still seeing people bought off um, by, by, you know, folks who think that, uh, you know, campaign finance is the, is the way to, to dominate a, a, a candidate. But those days are numbered right now. Um, you know, you, candidates who say, I can't do it because, you know, all my support comes from uh, people who support Israel. Yeah, but there are more people supporting Israel, uh, more people um, uh, who are supporting justice in the Middle East now than there are on the other side. And, uh, and within the Jewish community, there is this split. And J Street has been huge in making this split an actual reality that members of Congress can say, I'm getting support from the Jewish community, people who support justice, people who support a more balanced policy. It's a very different era that we're living in right now. I just have a couple more questions for you. Um, I want to build on this this answer that you just gave, though. In a in a relatively recent Washington Post poll, sixty seven percent of the respondents says that it, it's acceptable or even the duty of elected representatives to question the Israel U S relationship. And among Democrats, it was at eighty one percent. We know, though, that uh, uh, nineteen. I want to go get them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we know that, uh, uh, I mean, uh, the current administration is a disaster uh, for Palestinians. But we also know about President, uh, about Vice President Biden and Kamala Harris's record of absolutist, really, support for Israel, too. Uh, uh, when, we, when we were interviewing uh, Linda Sarsour a few weeks ago, th this is how she answered the question. She said uh, uh, about because she was a Sanders supporter, now uh, uh, she's all in for Biden. And she said she would rather have Biden as her opponent in the White House. And I thought that was a real interesting way for her to put it, because she felt like she could deal with that opponent as opposed to the other opponent. Can you talk about an, an activist strategy in a potential Biden administration? Two things. One is, um, it, it's well, more than two things. It's not just who's in the White House. Uh, it's who's with who's in the White House. Um, and uh, the people who will be working on these issues are people we can talk to, for sure. Um, you're confident about that. It sounds like you're confident about that. Well, I'm confident that there'll be some, for sure. I mean, look, they won't be perfect. But there's, we have no conversation with any of the people in the White House right now at all. It doesn't exist. It's like occupied territory. They don't, they don't talk. We don't want to talk to them either. Uh, I've met with Jason Greenblatt at conferences and stuff like that. Dumb as a post and unwilling to engage in conversation. Um, and so, yeah, this is a different crew. Um, secondly, um, the movement will continue because the call for justice will remain constant. Um, and so regardless of whether they want to deal with this issue or don't want to deal with the issue, it won't go away. Um, and change is coming. Change is coming in the constituencies that they represent. They're going to all have to run for office again. They're all going to have to be responsive to the changes taking place in Congress. They're going to have to be responsive to the changes taking place in the, in the, in the broader country. And so, yeah, uh, they, they will have to be responsive to it. This is the demographics of the Democratic Party are different than the demographics of the Republican Party. We're not dealing with white, middle-aged, um, you know, uh, born again um, folks who are feeling threatened that their America is is uh, is is leaving them because black people are moving into suburbs. We're dealing with a very different constituency crowd, and I think that that uh, we'll have a much greater possibility of raising these issues. And the question then is what's going to happen in the region? Um, will it create change in, in Israel if, if Joe Biden beats Donald Trump? Will it bring to a power a different political coalition? That's a long way off in Israel, but I will tell you, as long as the Republicans stay in office, uh, th there is no incentive. As long as there's no accountability, there's no incentive for anyone in Israel to challenge or change. 
Uh, and then there's a question of Palestinian leadership. Will they provide an alternative vision uh, that can mobilize the conscience of, of, uh, of people in, in the Arab world, but also the people here in America and give us something to fight for um, that we can actually mobilize around? Um, if I look at what Joe Biden has already done, I mean, number one, he said he's gonna go back to status quo ante, which is not a solution, but it's a hell of a lot better than we are, returning the money to UNRWA, returning the money to the yeah. West Bank, to the Palestinian development, reopening the PLO office, opening the consulate in East Drew. All those things are important, and I'm not gonna look down on them at all. I mean, I'm looking at refugees in Lebanon paying a dear price because Donald Trump doesn't see them as legitimate refugees and the Lebanese won't give them rights in, in Lebanon, et cetera. Um, number two, um, one of the most interesting little things in the platform was the insertion of um, language after opposing BDS that said that, uh, but we, pr we respect we will protect the First Amendment constitutional right of American citizens uh, to protest. And then in, the, in a, a further statement, Biden said, additional comma, which is why he condemned Israel for not allowing two members of Congress to visit, meaning Ilhan and Rashida. Um, that was important. <laughs> I'm not gonna, uh, you know, I'm not gonna just throw that one away and say, oh, he, uh, he didn't do anything. That's a big deal. Um, to say, I oppose BDS, but you have a right to BDS and I'm gonna protect your right to it and I'm gonna defend Ilhan and Rashida, that's important. Uh, that creates space for us to, uh, to, to, to work. And I think we'll take advantage of that space. Part of it's gonna be on us uh, to do the job. Let me close by asking you this. You know, I, I'm 67, and when my kids uh, have asked me their advice about various things in their lives, first time this or first time that, I've often been able to say something from my experience. And I know it's an overused term, uh, a cliche really, but we really are living, it seems to me, in some unprecedented times. You and I were talking before just about the, the COVID quarantining. And it seems like we live in two different countries with two different, radically different worldviews, two different value systems. Um, what inspires you? Uh, where, where, are we, where do you think we're headed? And really, really the question is, what gives you hope uh, uh, about our days uh, ahead? Look, I, um, uh, like you, um, I've lived Thank through, <laughs> pardon? Go ahead, please. L like you, I've, I've, I've lived, uh, well, right now, three quarters of a century. Uh, and I've seen a lot. And I've seen a lot of change uh, for the better. And I've seen also problems that seem to get worse. But I have, um, one of my favorite uh, Catholic theologians was Teilhard de Chardin, who, sure. who, um, who talked about the evolution of consciousness. Uh, he argues that um, in matter, um, as matter becomes more complex, it also becomes more conscious and aware. And so the, the but with the, the, the evolution to, hum, to the human species, evolution didn't stop. It went from physical evolution to conscious evolution. Um, I remember I was invited to speak at a, at a human rights, uh, UN human rights event in, in Northern Virginia on Human Rights Day uh, about 30 years ago. And I said, we're talking today about human rights in a world that doesn't respect human rights, but we're talking about it. A century ago, this concept didn't even exist. Um, human rights used to be my family. It was my village. At the most it ever was, was my country and only some people in my country. Um, I've seen over the last several decades, young people become literally moved to tears over Darfur or over the Rohingya in, in, in uh, uh, Miramar, uh, over Central Africa uh, and, and massacres there, uh, over Haiti over places that when I was their age, I didn't know existed. Um, and we now have that consciousness. 
and um, and I see the we've gone from not even being able to say the P word to a whole bunch of people today winning elections because they support Palestinian rights and justice. Um, yes, I can focus on the bad stuff, and Donald Trump certainly brings that out. But my sense is is that we are moving, always moving uh, to a better a better world. We're moving to a greater consciousness. I see a generation today, young generation, that has a global awareness, that has a commitment to, to compassion, a commitment to tolerance. I've seen us go from um, stoning gays to respecting gay marriage and it becoming the unquestionable right in so many states and cities across the country. Um, and I've seen <laughs> this is something like mixed marriage, which right was like even 50 years ago, you couldn't do it. Today, a mixed marriage is a Republican marrying a Democrat, right? I mean, <laughs> uh, we're, we're in a very different place. And I think that you can focus on the, the dark side. I prefer to focus on where we're going and what we're doing. I never want to lose sight of the dark. If you lose sight of the bad stuff that's happening, it's going to come and get you. But if you lose sight of the progress you've made and the direction you're moving in, then you stop working and you stop seeing that progress is possible. Um, so I keep my eye there, but I also keep one eye trained on what's coming on behind me because uh, I never want to turn my back on it. But I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful because I've seen change and it's real. It's not as quick as you want. Uh, too many people have suffered along the way, but we're making progress, man. It's happening and I see it every day. Um, and I also see things that, that, that give me hope. I mean, uh, we've, you know, we've, we've done some remarkable things um, in this country uh, for each other. Um, and, you know, we're, we're, I see no reason to ever want to give up. Um, I, somebody, I got an interview one time and did it in a, uh, an Egyptian newspaper. And they said, how do you define your life? I said, I'm Sisyphus. Um, ah. But I'm Sisyphus with a smile. And, and every time I'm rolling that sun up, I know I'm going to have to go back down and get it. But I also know that I'm going to get it again and I'm going to bring it back up and I get stronger every time I do it. Uh, so, you know, I, I have, I'm 74, but I'm stronger than I was when I was 40. Um, and I also have a better sense of what is possible today than what I, what I did when I, when I first started in this work. So thank you for the opportunity to speak to you all. And, uh, and I appreciate it. So Dr. Zogby, thank you for coming. Uh, do you have any parting words for us? Uh, three, buy my books, <laughs> Arab Voices in the Tumultuous Decade. Two, if there are any questions I didn't get to, you can write to me at jzogby, jzogby at aaiusa.org. And thirdly, if you want to follow me on Twitter, it's at JJZ1600. So that would be the end. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity.